Hi, I'm Stephen Galloway, and welcome to Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter, The Writers. I'd like to introduce Jordan Peele, Anthony McCartan, Fatih Akin, Aaron Sorkin, Darren Aronofsky, and Emily V. Gordon. Welcome. I want to start with this. There are hurricanes. There are dictators with nuclear bombs. The world is collapsing. Why write? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that writers are the best place people to be diagnosticians, um, but uh, we certainly, uh, our role, I think, is to entertain and to inform. Um, a large part of our work is research and, and trying to look at both parts of any argument. Um, the old dialectic that goes back to Plato showed two sides of an argument. And it's one of my big main ambitions is to enter complex situations where there seems to be one obvious answer and put two opposing ideas mm. into conflict and see what happens. And that's really the, the seed of all drama, really, is, the, is two equal and uh, opposite ideas colliding. And so that's what we do and, and what happens and the phenomena that result from that collision um, is not in our control. And I think drama is best when it shows the effects of those, uh, that collision and then stands back and allows the audience to make a sort what of judgment. What do you mean it's not in your control? Um, you may not be happy as the writer with what, what uh, the phenomena that results from these ideas. So you might enter a project thinking, well, I have this fixed position and this is my, this is my object of this particular project. Um, and, and then when you create an antagonist and you charge that antagonist with ideas that are virile and strong and, and convincing, you start to unhinge and, and crack open your own certainties. Mm. And, you, and when you've done your job really well, as a writer, the perfect sort of emotional state to end up in is uncertainty yourself. Hitler will not insist on outrageous terms. He will know his own weaknesses. He will be reasonable. When will the lesson be learned? When will the lesson be learned? How many more dictators must be uh, wooed, appeased, good God, given him mixed privileges, before we learn? You cannot reason with a tiger when your head is in its mouth. After 9-11, I felt for a while like I, I had the dumbest job uh, in the world. Uh, I felt useless. Uh, in the face of everything that was going on and uh, all, all the heroes uh, that there were. And I don't feel that way today. I feel like uh, that uh, the best uh, delivery system ever invented for an idea is a story. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that the stories just represented uh, at this table uh, have been so powerful uh, and so useful and as timeless as they are, they speak directly to the time that we're living in. I, th I think that's completely where I started with my project was I don't often walk into the field of politics and what's happening in the world. And I was just feeling tremendous frustration about where we were. It was the eighth year of Obama, ironically, but um, just leaning into environmental issues Everyone was talking about the summer that we just had about to happen. So it's, it was strange to release Mother, you know, as all of these travesties were happening here firsthand. Um, you know, there was this one uh, viral video I saw of a bunch of tourists in South America carrying around a baby dolphin and taking selfies, and they murdered the... And that is reflected exactly in my film for anyone who's seen it, where they carry around the baby. And um, so it, it was weird for me because I've never really just been like, you know what, I'm going to make a reflection of what's happening. Most of my things have been character studies. Mm. And um, this was the first time I decided to sort of, uh, sort of do a reflection. Um, and then it's interesting what you said because um, the reactions you get are often from all over the place. That, I think people yeah. come in with so many of their own different opinions. I've had everything from, you know, uh, this is a anti-immigration film <laughs> to, you know, to this is a portrait of Mother Earth to right. this is about the creative process and releasing 
your film to the world and having it devoured by audiences and stuff. So, um, which I think is great. I, I like when there's so many different interpretations and conversations about the work. That's always always the goal is you want to continue to have people thinking about it and talking Has about it. Has anybody said anything about your work that actually made you see it differently? Well, I think that one, the, the and it was, mo it was a lot of female artists came up to me. It started with Marina Abramovich and then a, a couple of female directors were producing and working with. They sort of had a very similar interpretation that it was, the baby was a symbol of um, creating a piece of art, which I never saw it. I was much more direct to the allegory and the biblical references mm. of it. Um, but a lot of people saw it that way. And also the celebrity thing about making something about a commentary on, on celebrity and fame, I was much more interested in worship um, from you know, a biblical perspective as opposed to modern celebrity. But I think that had to do with Jennifer Lawrence and Javier Bardem and Michelle Pfeiffer who deal with that in their lives. So people started to see that in the film. Hmm. Things that I didn't expect, but they come out. Emily, why write? <laughs> I think uh, my career before this was as a therapist. And so I, for many years, my job was to help clients kind of feel less alone, like in a room with them one-on-one -on -one or in groups. And I, what was fascinating to me as I kind of transitioned into writing was that that is another way to kind of help people feel less alone and help people kind of raise their empathy level. So that is always, to me, that is why I write when I'm justifying why I switch careers. It's to help people feel less alone and to help people feel like they're being seen in some regard. And as to what you were saying, that's, I have the same instinct as coming from a therapist and just in general that everyone is just doing the best they can, even if mm. they're a bad guy. Uh, and so why, is that, why does that person think that's the correct course of action and really kind of digging into that and then coming out to that uncertainty of like, oh, well, you think you're right also. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of taking you back and... and uh, causing you to rethink everything that you know. I, I think that's such a lovely thing for me personally, and I, I, if I can ever create anything that helps other people feel that way, that's, that's why I write. Is writing therapeutic for you? It can be, it depends on what you're writing about. I think uh, some days you don't want it to be, uh, and some days, uh, yeah, you feel like you're kind of exercising a demon, but you don't also want everything you have to be, at least for me, connected to like this very intense, cathartic experience. Um, you want to connect to it emotionally, but not have it kind of ring you out. Your film is actually an autobiographical Yeah, that, story. that one rang me out a little. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was it tough to bring yourself to write it, or was it actually helpful? It had been five years since the events of the film, and I think that helps tremendously, because you're far enough away that you can kind of look at it and still kind of feel it, but not so much that it's overwhelming you. Because I think if you see someone create a piece of art while they're still in the throes of going through something, you can always kind of tell because it feels too, it feels like you're looking, it feels too vulnerable for you to be watching, which can be beautiful, but we didn't want this to feel like a, an overly intense kind of movie that you feel in danger while you're watching. We wanted you to kind of see that we've gotten a little bit of emotional distance. Um, and so I think to me, that's where this movie came from is us having enough emotional distance, uh, but not so much that it felt like the distant past. It didn't heckle you. It just woohooed you. It was supportive. Okay, that's a common misconception. Uh -huh. but yelling anything at a comedian is considered heckling. Heckling doesn't have to be negative. So if I if I yelled out like, "You're amazing in bed," <laughs> that'd be a heckle. Yeah, it would be an accurate heckle. Cool. Oh. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh. So now cool. you can. I'm going. <laughs> you scared my friend off now. You can't be precious with your own history because it, it's. If you saw a movie, what actually happened to my husband and I, it would be a terrible movie and you would not enjoy it. Uh, and so, taking this actual real life event that uh, touched you and was very important to you and and creating a story from it um, is always a challenge. And not and also realizing that just because something was important to you personally, that doesn't mean it belongs in the movie and that doesn't mean that it's gonna translate. Mm -hmm. So what we would try to do was if there was a scene that was incredibly important to us, it happened like three or four times, like this moment was like, oh, it meant everything to us. And we would either write it and it didn't work. One of them we filmed and it just, as we were filming it, we we're like, this is so stupid. This will never be in this movie. Finding a lateral move, like what were the emotions? Why was this so important? What were we feeling? What was happening? And then can we craft a scene that accomplishes that? Um, because this exact moment of you coming into my hospital room and watching uh, Groundhog Day with me on a laptop is not really giving us the awe that we need on screen uh, and finding other ways to kind of show that. So that I think that was the most challenging thing was uh, understanding that your story, just because it's your story, is not 
gospel. Did you write because you like the fun of doing a horror story or because you wanted to convey ideas about racism? It, it began as the fun of a horror story. I wanted to, I wanted, it's my favorite genre. I wanted to have fun while writing. Um, and it turned, you know, in the middle of the process, it turned into something more important. The power of story is that it is w one of the few ways we can really feel empathy and encourage empathy. Built into the idea of story is the idea that you have a protagonist. And when you have a protagonist, the whole trick that all of us are trying to do is bring the audience into that protagonist's eyes, behind their eyes. And so this is, you know, a, a well-crafted story and, a, and a, a good story is one of the few ways we can really not tell somebody you have to feel for somebody else, but make somebody feel because they're, they're experiencing it through entertainment. Sir, can I see your license, please? Wait, why? Yeah, I have state ID. No, 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 he wasn't driving. I didn't ask who was driving, I asked to see his ID. Yeah, why? That doesn't make any sense. Here. You don't have to give him your ID because you haven't done anything wrong. Maybe baby, baby, it's okay, come on. Anytime there is an incident, we have every right to That's ask. Cool. Ma'am, the... Well, that's the power of cinema, that you can, you know, make a film about a six-year-old girl in Iran or an 80-year-old guy in the UK, and if the filmmaking is working, you can completely connect with them. Mm -hmm. I think when I was watching Get Out the, in the theater the first time, and I was an audience, mostly white people, and at the end of the movie, when the police car rolls up and the lights go on, I, w I heard the audience go, oh, no! And I thought, what a great thing that we've gotten an audience of mostly white people to be up, like upset about seeing a cop car because they know this is not going to be good until Lil Rel pops up and you're like, everything's fine. But I, I thought, what a, that's a great exercise in empathy that everyone suddenly got why that was such an awful thing to happen in that moment. Whereas normally the police car means everything's going to be fine. Like everything, the problems are solved. I thought that was such an amazing exercise and empathy. Thank you. Yeah. You know, the, I was worried at several stages during the writing of, of the movie that this would be this horribly divisive project where, you know, I thought, I thought may, maybe I'd lose black people because it's, we're, you know, we're victims in the movie and that's hard to watch. That's not fun. Maybe I'd lose white people because white people are the villains in the movie and that would be an assault. That would be. And so, but... I, I stuck with it, and one of the, you know, just the most um, fulfilling and validating things to see was how an audience, you know, would sort of go in, you know, with their different preconceived notions of what the film were, but by the middle, they were all Chris. They were all the main character. Um, and that's kind of the... It's a really good horror movie. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious. Is it tr I had heard that there was a time in your writing process when the police car showed up and it was the police and it was the bad ending that we uh, all, all feared. Is, it, yeah. is that true? So that's true. I wrote the movie primarily during the post-racial lie. So the Obama era, when everyone was saying, hey, we're past racism. Mm. Right? We did it. We did it. <laughs> um, and the, the, the notion of sort of bringing up racism was almost thought of as like the perpetuating it. Mm -hmm. And so the movie was originally meant to be a more direct, brutal wake up call to say, no, the, the, the horror movie, guess what? The horror movie with a black protagonist, the cops showing up at the end is a different, that's, that's a different thing. And it became very clear by showing people the movie that they want. They needed a hero. Mm -hmm. They needed. Mm -hmm. They needed an, uh, the movie to be an escape. What I love about the current ending is that moment you're talking about, where the the police show up. The audience does all the work mm -hmm. of the original ending, and then I so it's have my cake and eat it too. Yeah, you really do. That's exactly right. <laughs> when you go into a story, do you know the ending in advance? When you start writing, well, I think you ought to in a perfect world because everything is a, the rest of the writing work then becomes a preparation for that perfect ending. I often find that that writers who disavow the importance of an ending are just not very good at endings, um, and so they um, they you know they fudge it and they try to raise the quality of other elements of storytelling. 
but, but to me, it's critical to know what you're working towards so that you can fade and faint away from that and take the audience away and mislead and do all those, those just craft things that, that, that are so important to a great story. Do you agree with that, Fatih? It's diff different from screenplay to screenplay. It depends on the material. With the, with the last film, with In the Fade, In the Fade, one of the first images I had was the ending. Huh. You oh. know, it, it was like there, like, okay, how, how I'm gonna have to write this to get to there. So I was kind of like writing it backwards. Mm -hmm. You know, but sometimes, sometimes it's completely different. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes I start because I have a great idea for an opening, mm. but I don't know how to end it. You've made very political films, which inevitably must be divisive. How do you react to hate mail, people who disagree with you? Uh, before this round tape began, we were talking about one of your films, mm. uh, you're Turkish German, uh, but you made a, a, a film that was very sympathetic to the idea of the Armenian genocide. Uh, how did your family and friends react to that? Uh, my, my family loves me. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. Know, yeah, my parents do love me and they don't want me to get in any trouble. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm curious about trouble. I, I like to be involved in kind of like Trouble, not trouble on the street, but like writing something and I don't know, provocate something. I definitely believe in discussions. You know, if you if you go out, go to the cinema and you come out and two people have two different opinions and they talk about it, so you create a dialogue. And I think you can solve everything with a dialogue. And um, the Armenian genocide is um, is something which is uh, it's based about fear. There's a film by Rainer Werner Fassbinder, you know, mm -hmm. the German filmmaker. Sure. Um, Fear eats soul, yeah. Angst essen Seele auf. Mm -hmm. And I believe in that, you know, and so I don't want, I don't want that my fears get be eaten, you know. So hate mails and stuff, they don't really, I force myself that I don't let them fear me, you know. Mm. You couldn't have made that film in Turkey, I don't suppose. No, I couldn't. No, no I couldn't. But that was not the film I get the most trouble for, you know? I just posted something on Instagram, you know? Mm -hmm. You mean the cut was not the film? It the was not the which film one was? which um, I hadn't shot it yet. <laughs> you oh. know, I just put something on Instagram. Which you is, know, and what is that? About Kurdish freedom fighters in North oh. Syria. You know, I would like to do a film about that because you have like these, I don't know, female characters and they fight against ISIS and this is somehow like fascinating me, you know, and I... Would this be to advance the idea of a Kurdish state? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's provocative. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they freaked out, you know. So the Armenian genocide was a joke for that, you know. That wow. was like Do you ever go back to Turkey? Do you, are you ever threatened by <sighs> anyone? My parents live there and uh, I cannot go there right now. Right now, not. Because Maybe of, in the future. Because of Erdogan and the regime or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you feel safe in Germany? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, there is this bus, like, because there are a lot of Turkish immigrants, you know, like somehow um, the conflict in Turkey, you know, swept over to, to, the, to the Turkish minorities. It's not, it's not so, it's not, that, it's not that dangerous how the press or the media in Germany uh, uh, um, describes that. There is not a real conflict between, I don't see or feel the conflict between Turks and, and, and Germany yet. But I'm an artist, I'm writing. I'm at home in front of my computer, so sometimes I'm a bit out of the streets, so sometimes I, I don't really know what's going on. Darren, did you think that your film would be as divisive as it is? Yeah, I think we did. Um, <laughs> I, we knew it was always going to be an assault of the senses and um, very intense, but, you know, then again, if you read any record, any paper of record, and you actually look past the headlines, um, what happens in any A section of a newspaper is a lot more messed up than anything that's in my movie. But I think once you 
put it into a house and put movie stars in front of it that you're empathizing with, it becomes a different level of intensity. And that was the idea behind it. But we knew it would be all over the place and a big explosion. And we were excited about that. We were excited to make a film that um, would have conversation and would have big debate. No, no, I didn't abandon you. They just lost the son. They lost, well, two sons. I was helping them. This is not about us, it's about them. No, it's not about them. It's about you. It's always about you and your work. You think that's gonna help you, right? Nothing does. I rebuilt this entire house, wall to wall. You haven't written a word. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't write. How do you handle the critiques? Do they hurt? I don't fully allow myself in front of them. I, I, you know, my mentor, Stuart Rosenberg, always said, um, bad reviews hurt, good reviews are worse. <laughs> and I thought that was <laughs> Great very line. smart. Yeah, yeah, it was a good line. Very and, good line. Um, <clears throat> and I sort of live by that. But in today's world, because of just how connected everyone is, you can't sort of escape information coming from different places and, and, and bombarding you. So I have, a, I have a sense of what's going on. It, it doesn't upset me. It excites me that, you know, people are arguing in discussions. I think that's... The sign, that, those are the films that inspired me, the ones that people leave and you're just breaking down and figuring out and seeing different layers and you know, seeing the, all the different ways of thinking about something. The, the fear for me is to be a disposable piece of cinema that you know, it's like a McDonald's meal and the mm -hmm. wrapper goes in the trash and two hours later you're, you're like, what, what did I see? You know? And there's a lot of that. Def there. Definitely. Is and, this a golden age for the movies or is it the rust age? <laughs> Well, I, you know, I feel like we're... Or age for us, right? <laughs> well, you know, I, I feel like that we're sort of entering uh, a, a, hopefully, a new renaissance. In film? In, in film, where, um, where, you know, the, where auteurs are, are embraced. You know, I mean, obviously, we've been in this, you know, in a bit of era of the, the huge, big, you know, big, big, huge special effects movie. And, um, you know, we've, we all remember sort of, I think, better times for, for us as artists in the film, in the film, film industry. So I think we're uh, heading in a very good direction. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, uh, Darren, one, what, what I really cherish about your, your films and your craft is that you, you are able to show how diving into something completely stressful, completely uncomfortable, completely assaulting, can still be entertainment and can still be fun. Thank you. And it's one of those things that- but Does it have to be fun? Should it, it, it should be, be entertaining, it entertaining. I think yeah. rule number one is you don't bore an audience. You know, you have to, even if they're not enjoying themselves or they're off, as long as they're engaged and they're with the character and they're following the plot and they're not sort of staring off into space or thinking about their second screen, that's our goal. And that, that's the, how do, you, how do we keep people from watching our movies at home without a second and sometimes third screen, which is, you know, happening everywhere. And, and mm -hmm. the only way to do that is to keep it coming and, and to engage emotionally. I also don't like medicine movies that are like, I'm supposed to get this lesson out of this movie. That's why I want them to be entertaining. Whether or not I'm enjoying it or not enjoying it, I want them to not just be like, here's your lesson for today. I, I, want, uh, I want to be wowed. You took a real life story and adapted it. What did you have to lose in the translation? What changed the most? Uh, you know, th listen, when I uh, uh, do nonfiction, um, it's, it's not a documentary uh, uh, still. I, I think I've used this metaphor with you before, that, that it's, uh, it's still a painting and not a photograph. I use the parts that I need to tell the story that I kind of saw when I, I first started learning about this. And uh, I, I don't use the parts that I, I don't need. 
I can see you're getting warmed up, but I really don't have the emotional bandwidth to defend my, as usual, irresponsible behavior. I know. I got your email. I get that I'm not welcome in your life right now as your father, though you should know I could give a shit if I'm welcome or not. But I'm not here in my capacity as your father. I'm indifferent to whether your father lives or dies. I'm a very expensive therapist, and I'm here to give you one free session. You think what I need right now is a therapist? <laughs> yeah. I read uh, a, a, a review of Molly's Game, in fact, and it was a positive review. And a critic noted that I've, I've done a bunch of nonfiction movies in a row. But what I really do is that I, I use these characters for parts. Um, and I make my own thing. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I read that and I went, yeah, I think I do uh, uh, do that. Um, I'm not sure if that was meant as a compliment or not, but I'm, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure I do do that. So, but is it okay to take a real life person then then reinvent that person with the same name on screen? Is that morally okay? That I I do ask myself that question. I'm not indifferent at all uh, uh, to that question, and I think that all of us have uh, a kind of internal moral compass uh, uh, that we use. I, I have faith in mine. In this particular case, in the case of Molly Bloom, she was very involved in uh, that. Uh, I spent about six months talking to her uh, before the writing began. Her? Oh yeah, uh, I talked to her every day. Did she like the film? She did. She saw it for the first time at the Toronto. Uh, a film festival. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I, you know, I said we'll set up a screening room for you mm -hmm. and for your family because you know her father uh, uh, plays a big role in the story too. Um, and she called me and she said, you know, we all, meaning the, the whole Bloom family, we'd really love to see it with an audience. You know, have a, have a real movie experience. And um, uh, and I said sure, but I, I'd been cautioning her for a couple of years that there's nothing that's going to be able to prepare you for this experience mm -hmm. for someone, as you said, up on the screen named Molly Bloom, only it's Jessica Chastain. Um, and uh, uh, listen, you know, we all know that life doesn't play itself out as a series of scenes that, that form a perfect narrative. Mm -hmm. People don't speak in dialogue. Uh, th th these, are, these are movie things that make it a painting instead of a photograph. So uh, she and her family, uh, were, they're big fans of the movie. They're, they're very moved. What changed the most in bringing Churchill to the screen? What did you not convey about him that you would have liked to? There's a really fine line between artistic license, I think, and artistic licentiousness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and there's, you know, history is, is a lousy filmmaker. It doesn't give you all the ingredients you need. And, and no story will quite fulfill that three act structure, as, as, as uh, Aaron's saying. Uh, however, you, you're compelled to apply your imagination to a real life story. And if you don't, it will be inert, or it will be just a sequence, like an action, vast action sequences of the known. And it won't tell you anything we don't already know from documentaries. Hmm. So, um, but however, there's a really fine line because if you say that Napoleon won the Battle of Waterloo, your movie collapses. The, the tolerances of history are very similar to the tolerances of audiences. And that if you breach that faith, mm. and you've got that before your movie starts based on a true story, and you go over that red line, which is indistinct, and every writer will draw it in a different mm -hmm. place, and you, you're really bravely saying, I'm going to go impressionistic mm -hmm. with my portraits. Um, I, did, I dared not do that with with Winston Churchill, you know, he's too beloved, he's too iconic. You can't do it with Lincoln. I agree, and you know, what I, mean? um, uh, you know I wouldn't, if, if, if I were writing all the president's men, yeah. uh, I, I wouldn't make anything up about no. the fall of a, a no. president of the United States. Well, you know, this, this goes to, you know, really the conversation about genre as well, because, mm. which I, I find completely fascinating that you know, we, we have, we all think of, we, we all have a structure in mind when we write a movie, some three-act structure, four-act structure, whatever it is. But there's also conventions and ideas surrounding every genre. With, with a thriller, for example, there's a contract with the audience before they even come in that they're going to see something fucked up, that they're going to be s scared, Jump that, scares. Yeah. Probably and some so, jump scares. There's going to be some jump scares. And so, you know, 
you know, the genre does sort of dictate a lot of the, the rules in a weird way. And I hate using the word rules because there are none. But if you look at something like Inglorious Bastards, which is, you know, theoretically a historical and movie. And changed the end of World War II. And completely yes. changed the end of World <laughs> right. War II. But it works because it exists in its own genre of pulp mm -hmm. entertainment. Um, so that, that's, that's, you know, part of the reason uh, the thriller genre to me is so alluring is because you're almost not doing it right if you're not pushing the boundaries of, of mm -hmm. good taste and, and, and darkness and sort of challenging an audience. Did Mo Why'd you turn to me? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I was saying, I mean. Does uh, mother belong to Jean? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think I've ever really sort of sat in genre too well. You know, Pi was sort of an independent mm -hmm. film, sort of sci-fi. The Fountain was, I don't know what it was to this day. <laughs> uh, the Wrestler, my biggest letdown was um, no. the ESPN. You mean letdown uh, commercially? No, my biggest letdown personally because ESPN wouldn't call it a sports movie, so I couldn't get their trophy. Oh. And I was like, it is a sports movie. And they're like, Definitely wrestling's a not a sport. Yeah. Um, and Black, Sw Black Swan was like, people were like, you know, horror fans don't like ballet, and ballet people don't like horror. Also and a sports I can make movie. It. And also a sports movie, too. But mm -hmm. ESPN didn't recognize. No. So I don't think I really fall into genre, um, but I do love genre. And uh, I, I love creating genre moments for an audience, because I think, you know, Audiences have expectations, and when you sort of present them jump scares or thrilling moments and tension, they completely go for it. So mm. littered throughout Mother, I kept falling into genre films, but I think when it added up to everything, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really fit neatly into any of them. I just don't, I think when it comes out of me personally, that's where my passions lie, is to tell that type of story and just be truthful. To, to the allegory and to the emotion of the story and not necessarily fully service the genre. Did you ever think of doing your film as a drama, a straight drama, not a comedy? We, we talked about it. We actually didn't think that our movie was a rom-com until the marketing people started talking to us. <laughs> and they were like, oh, okay. And we started seeing cuts of trailers and we were like, oh, I guess this is a rom-com. I always thought of it as a, a, like a funny family drama. That's kind of how I thought of it. And we had the same thing of like, if we go into this, like this is a comedy, now comedy means four or five big, huge set piece action scenes. Like uh, comedy means a very specific thing now, unfor unfortunately. Uh, drama also means a specific thing where maybe you can't make a 9-11 joke. Uh, so I think, uh, I think for us, we tried not to think about that. But in my head, it was always like a very funny family, mo like f movie about families. And then when we saw all the marketing, we were like, oh, rom-com, okay? <laughs> Which to me is a very different set of expectations. And uh, it's just interesting. And I, my friend, by the way, uh, Pi was one of my favorite movies, and my friend described it as brain horror rather than body <laughs> horror, which is a great genre. That might be my genre. Brain <laughs> horror. <laughs> is there anything you would not do on film that you're scared to touch any subject? No, there are no limits. I would try everything. Everything what, what somehow touches me, whatever it is, can be, I don't know, can be porn, whatever it is. <laughs> you know. Have you ever tried porn? Um, I'm thinking about to write something about it, but uh, I didn't try it, no. Have you ever asked that question in one of these rounds? <laughs> <laughs> I actually think I asked a similar question. <laughs> I watched some, but I haven't. When you got in the, in the fade off the ground, was it a difficult film to get made? Well, actually it wasn't because previous film I did before, it was a film called Goodbye Berlin. It was a genre film. It was for like German audience. It was based on a German novel. It was um, box office in Germany. So I could do in the fate like very easy. It was a very quick financing, you know, like I financed the film, wrote the film and I don't know, shot the film in six months. Hmm. You know, that wow. was kind of like the fastest film I ever did. What's been your toughest moment as a writer? You know, sometimes you spend years writing something. You know. Give me one moment <coughs> that you found really, really tough, where maybe you thought of giving up. Did you ever think of giving up? Um, in, when there was no like iCloud thing, you know, once I wrote something for like 18 months and I have a problem with my computer oh, and I lost the whole mm. file. Gosh. You know, that was, that was like, you have like a very old wine, red wine, mm -hmm. like 200 years ago and 
the bottle broke. You know, it, it, it was something it, like it's, that. It's much worse than that. What's been your toughest that. moment, Aaron? Listen, most of the time, um, uh, I, uh, I really struggle uh, uh, with writing. You know, people ask if I have writer's block. That, that's my default position. So most days I go to bed not having done anything except uh, kind of climb the walls uh, because I don't have an idea or I'm stuck uh, uh, where I am. And you, you really do think, e even though you've been there many, many times before and it's worked out, uh, you really do think in that moment you're not ever going to write again. Those are tough moments. Uh, another tough moment is uh, when you you see something in your head that's that's good that's really beautiful that uh, that can work, and you were just not able to. to but I want to know transfer in your fairly long career as a writer. Was there one moment where you thought I'm going to give up? Uh, no, no. Um, Did anybody ever tell you you should give up? That I should give up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, no. I've been lucky. I haven't had that. Uh, Sorry, what about you? Mind. There's so many struggling moments during making a movie. The amount of no's you get as a filmmaker are every day endless. And that's why the only films I know how to make are films that I, I just couldn't live without making them. They're just burning from deep inside. And, um, and no matter what they are, I just know I have to follow that feeling. Another thing Stuart Rosenberg said is, you know, you just try your hardest you know, and then when you look back, you can respect yourself for having tried the hardest at the time. So that's kind Would of. Do you ever do a franchise film? You at one point were talking about doing Batman. Yeah, um, I've always been intrigued and interested in those. I guess I've been lucky enough to have um, enough success with the pa each film that allows me to find an angle to make these films that. I can sort of guarantee no one else on the planet wants to make, mm. <laughs> which has always been, for me, the filmmakers I like are the filmmakers who clearly made the films that only they wanted to make. Whoever, even if they weren't successful films or popular films, if they just come from this singular voice and you know, singular vision that sort of expands you know, what cinema can be, that's always been an inspiration. I want to go back to what we were talking about, which is this idea of you're saying we're entering a golden age, and I want to separate film from television because I think everybody recognizes this is a great age in television. Is it really a great age in film? With the Harvey Weinstein story, we're dealing with sexual harassment, we're dealing with abuse. Right is kind of the lowest person on the totem mm. pole historically. Have you been abused by producers, by the system, any of you? I know a, a mm. film director who said he had an a, a anti-shout clause included in his deal with Harvey. <laughs> um, he said, I'll do the movie, but if that guy shouts, the rights revert. Huh. Um, and apparently that was included. It was unprecedented. That's but an just, amazing clause. Yeah. It was a great clause. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, I haven't been um, uh, uh, abused by a producer. You've worked with some tough producers. Scott Rudin. Scott in particular. <laughs> yeah. Um, has that ever become contentious? Listen, I think Scott is a, uh, a, a great producer in, in, in the three phases where you need a great producer. He is, at least for me, a, a terrific script editor. I think I've done my best writing uh, with Scott. And he gets the movie made, and he gets it made for a, the budget that you need, and then he rides herd over a very sophisticated marketing campaign. I've worked with Scott many times before, and I hope I get a chance to work with him uh, uh, again a lot. Uh, but where, where you need a Scott, any of us at this table would have an easier time getting a $100 million movie made than a $10 million movie. Um, uh, studios are just much more comfortable making a $100 million movie uh, than, a, than a $10 million movie. They're not quite sure how to market the $10 million movie. And the Scots and the Harveys are experts at, uh, at marketing those $10 million movies. Mm -hmm. Have you dealt, uh, Darren and Emily, with bullying, with a conflict, with situations that you didn't think were ethically right in the business? I've been pretty lucky. I mean, I guess I had one very publicized fight with a studio you know, over the final cut of Noah. Um, and there were a lot of pressures coming from not just commercial ends, but, you know, personal religious beliefs as well. 
And that was a rough journey to get through. Um, eventually, you know, because I get the films I make are so, uh, I guess, uh, strange in how I put them together. They're very hard to sort of re-jigsaw puzzle them into anything else. So ultimately, I ended up getting the film I wanted to make. But, um, you know, I, I thought there were questionable ethics when you go into something very clear about what you want to make and everyone's upfront about it with incredible clarity that this is what we're making and it's signed off on and the screenplay is greenlit and you deliver that and then, you know, then you have to deal with um, pressures. But I, I understand that that's also the game of making a film for $115 million that, you know, that's a lot of money and people need to get their money back. Um, there just was no way I mean, it comes down to yeah. testing for me. That's where I have ethical issues because oh. my films do not test. Oh. <laughs> I mean, Black Swan didn't yeah. test. I just make these films that, you know, will you definitely recommend Black Swan? You know, it's not going to happen because <laughs> yes, there's a lot yes. of people who are just going to be, that's too freaky. And I think my <laughs> films need a little bit of a marketplace and critical response to sort of set it up in the world. Um, so that's the only thing I've run into in my... Emily? Um, very sad to say I've been lucky, I guess. I hate to say it. Sad to like, say. No, I mean, I, I guess I'm saying, like, it's a bummer that I have to say, oh, I've been lucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. uh, I have been lucky in that I have not experienced uh, any direct personal uh, harassment or abuse. I, I mean, uh, I, especially for this film, which was my first film, uh, I realize now, looking back and talking to other people, that we were taken on, both my husband and I were taken on as, like, we were part of the team that was doing everything. And I think that, uh, I know that that's rare, and I, I'm imagining that that probably won't always be the case. I mean, you deal with the ethical issues that your husband has to deal with in the business. Oh, absolutely. You know. Yeah. Meaning? Uh, my husband's Muslim. Yeah. So he's, there's tons of issues, and the, and the film addresses it in straight on. In the entertainment business. I think in, it's beyond that, probably, yeah. I would think, but well, definitely you know, in the entertainment the, business. I think this, you know, and to the, the Harvey question, it goes to this greater question of this systemic problem as well. And I think the industry is just as part of the system um, and its shortcomings as the system at large, the larger system itself. You know, I based the movie pretty much on the Stepford Wives, which sort of does for gender yeah. what I wanted to do with race. Mm -hmm. And it got me thinking about um, a lot of things, but that this there's this systemic issue that holds many of us back and many of us behind. And, you know, I've never met Harvey Weinstein. Um, I know he's one of a kind, but I know that there are many other people who, you know, have, uh, are, are similar out there. And there is this, it, it's part of the problem with, with why we haven't seen stories, why we haven't seen people, um, more women get ahead in this industry um, is because of, you know, th that that's happening all over the place mm. um, and every day and on all sorts of levels of, of the industry. So, he, I, you know, I think he's a bad guy, but it's, it's, it's completely systemic. Mm. It's everywhere. And, you know, and you can work in an office and there could be a Harvey Weinstein in your yeah. office. You know, it's not, it's not a Hollywood issue as much as it is a, any time that there is a power structure, uh, this can be an issue, and that's literally everywhere. I, I'd like oh. each of you to name one screenplay that has particularly influenced you or stuck out for you. I'm fascinated by Apocalypse Now, the whole writing process with like not finding an end. Life is be like that, life can be like that, writing can be like that, not finding the end. That's why I was, what I said in the beginning, I was very thankful that once I have the end, you know, like, okay, it will not be Apocalypse Now. That, that was very inspiring, hmm. that writing process. Uh, fascinated or is it a film that you, whose screenplay you particularly admire, which one? Both. Hmm. Oh, that makes this screenplay for me so special. Anthony, what about you? Um, I'm trying to separate in my mind great <laughs> films from great screenplays, and it's probably hard to do because uh, great screenplays usually end up with It's a, interesting with a great you film. as a writer blend the two and don't, don't separate them. You yeah. Know? 
Yeah, I mean, from a pure, you know, when I watched, I'll avoid the question completely and just say when I watched recently, right? It was a it was a very stagey kind of production, but it was Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross by David mm. David Mamet, and I just could not st my admiration for the for the writing of that. I think it's one of the great American plays, but it turned into for me. Um, and people would say, "Oh, it's too theatrical," but I think it's just a terrific. What did you movie. admire the most about the writing? Um, it it had and Aaron, Aaron's writing has this too it, it's it's not realistic it's a notch above realistic and it creates a new poetry in mm. in the vernacular so people aren't being poetic it's not Shakespeare mm. but there is a poetic element to it so the rhythms then become musical mm -hmm. um, Arthur Miller did this he uh, you know with Eugene O'Neill they liberated dialogue and, and and gave it and Tennessee Williams and they mm. they lifted it one notch above real and to me I love words. The, the, yeah. the, the, the Churchill movie is about the power of words. Mm -hmm. To get the right words and, and, and discover that they can be enlisted to change the world. And they really can. And so great writing, um, great screenplays achieve that. They, they create a, a poetic. Erin, what about you? One screenplay you particularly admire? Network. Uh, 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 for the reasons we've heard it. It's uh, Paddy Chayefsky, Filled that screenplay with great theatrical language, uh, uh, you know, every bit as meaningful as any image uh, in the movie. And for uh, a, a little kid sitting in a movie theater who really loved plays, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I grew up on the East Coast and I went to see plays all the time. And oftentimes they were plays that I was too young to understand. Even so, uh, you know, what I I loved the sound of dialogue. It sounded like music to me, and speeches sounded like. Arias uh, uh, here, uh, it's the first time I think I can remember thinking, you can do that in, in movies too. And um, I, I was not at all interested in what Sidney Lumet uh, uh, was doing. Um, I thought I'd, I want to be the guy who's, uh, who's writing that. Darren. I think the, the first thing that popped in my head is probably the social network. Um, was just, I couldn't put it down. I read a lot of scripts and it's rare I do one sitting type of thing. Um, it just, it, it drove you through it. And I think the musicality of it, of the dialogue, uh, realizing it's not fully real yet, it, it's, it is real and um, it is grounded, but it's kind of in a different level. It's something I could never write or get to. I'm, I'm just very connected just trying to make stuff sound as real as I hear them, but to actually create your own kind of language, but it's still connectable to all people. I, I remember where I was when I read it. Oh, thanks, Darren. Emily. Um, I tend to go dialogue. I tend to be really appreciative of dialogue. Uh, and and uh, so that's why the uh, screenplay of Moonlight kind of struck me because it uh, is is not the most like dialogue heavy, but it, it, it was just really gorgeous for me to kind of watch that screenplay unfolds, having read it after seeing the movie, which is always kind of an odd yeah. thing to do, but um, I was really impressed with the way it was uh, laid out. How about you, Jordan? You know, I want to go back to the Stepford Wives and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Rosemary's Baby as well, mm. both both mm. Ira Levin Good Lord. stories. And um, yeah. for me, the, those, those movies were both extremely inspiring because what they did within the thriller genre was this very delicate tightrope walk um, that sort of honored the protagonist in a way that you, you rarely see in, in, in the genre um, these days. And um, I guess what I mean is they, the, the, the characters in that movie, the protagonists are, are smart and they're investigative and they're on the trail, and there's never a point that every step into weird town that mm. those movies makes, it does an equal, um, there's an equal effort to justify why the character doesn't run screaming. Mm. And that, to me, is that, that, that sort of dance between showing something weird and over the top, and then showing how easily it can be placed with how weird reality is, mm. Um, was that's, you know, that's the technique I, I, I brought to get out. Uh, you're throwing a dinner party. 
and you're allowed to have three guests. Who would they be? And any, would time they, uh, any time period? Any time period. And would they be writers? At least one of mine would be a writer, Mark Twain. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Oh, that's you know, What a great choice. Yeah. I would, and here's another writer, Martin Luther King. Who also knew how to harness words like Churchill. Yeah, you know, and you know what, I'll, I'll take a third writer, and I think this might be the uh, best American writer of all time, Thomas Jefferson. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's I a love dinner your party. dinner party. I want to be there <laughs> yeah. for tea. Three people at a dinner uh, party. How difficult. Can I, you know, uh, I'll go, go I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll go filmmaker. Thanks. I'll go director, okay. since you aren't writer. <laughs> I, well, Herzog, but... The problem is, when we did the director's we had table, a round table and it was like, and why are any of us talking? Let's just <laughs> listen to Herzog. Because so, he like, Herzog kind voice. of fills up a table, yeah. you know, so. I always wonder if in German, Herzog has the same effect he has <laughs> when he speaks English. <laughs> no, appara no, apparently doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even know what it is. That accent. Werner Herzog. Werner Herzog. 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 Terry Gilliam, oh, that would be fun to be with him, and uh, I guess I'd bring back Fellini. Oh wow! You know, Emily. Nah, that's a good deal. <laughs> Fellini would be doodling the whole thing. He'd be doing <laughs> pornographic doodles. That's fine. Of all of us. <laughs> I think I'm going to go John Hughes. Mm -hmm. I think I would like to just have a conversation. Why not dinner also? Um, who else? I think I'd want, even though it's a little cheating because I know her, Holly Hunter, because um, I just, she, I could listen to her stories endlessly about working in this industry for so long um, from so many different angles. Maybe, maybe Stanley Kubrick. Hmm. Interesting mix. Wow. Jordan. Yeah, that's fun. That's a fun table. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'd, I'd put Hitch, Hitchcock. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that'd be just to, just to pick his brain and hopefully get Riley insulted by him. <laughs> um, Spike Lee, who uh, I do know, I'm uh, producing a project of his, and he is um, also, I, I, I just so soak up everything about filmmaking that he has to offer, and he's so fun and, um, and, and boisterous and engaging. And, um, you know, then let's, you know, I, I would say... Uh, Steve Martin, <laughs> who I just love Steve Martin. Keep it going, the conversation. To, yeah, keep, to keep the conversation <laughs> yeah. going. Keep I it, think about keep that stuff. Well, I'd have to have Churchill to find out how close I got. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want him to have seen your movie or not? Uh, preferably not. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> do you think he would have liked the movie? Well, I had the experience of doing the Stephen Hawking movie, and we showed the movie to Stephen. I was terribly anxious about what what we what he would say, and he he dialed in his response. He twitches his cheek, but there's a camera on his cheek, and he said, "Broadly true." Oh, uh, fair enough. Which that works. Nice. So I'd I'd have uh, I'd have Mr. Churchill. I'd have um, William Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Ah. And, I, and I would say to yeah. I would say William, I would say to William, did you did you write all those plays? Yes. I, I want to know whether he wrote all those plays. And then uh, what do you think? Maybe Napoleon. And what do you think he did write? Them? Huh? Do you think he did write them? Yeah, invariably. But if you know anything about theatre, it's a collaborative thing. Well, now so they he did, would have they, done they, the first draft. Yeah, they've done computer analysis of some of the last ones, like Two yeah. Noble Kinsmen, where yeah. they've actually they can find other. Language. We all know that actually the if final he only draft, wrote one of them, <laughs> exactly, he'd <laughs> good be enough. Said. Yeah, right. <laughs> and Napoleon would, in, would would be there to invade every conversation. <laughs> Since it is a dinner party, you said I would invite three women. You know, I would invite Marlene Dietrich. Marlene Dietrich. Mm -hmm. Marlene Dietrich? Yes. Marlene Dietrich. I would invite Marilyn Monroe, definitely, and I would invite Audrey Hepburn. These three uh, ladies. Yeah. Can I come? <laughs> yeah, you can. That's you're all welcome. Good. Um, last question. I want to ask each of you, f for one piece of advice that you would give to a starting writer. What is the line of Beckett? Y you know the line of Beckett. Yes, like you this. mean fail again, fail. Fail better. The piece of writing advice uh, uh, that I would give them is intention and obstacle. Uh, uh, cling to that like what a lifeboat. 
you you can't. That's what drama is. You can't do anything if you don't have in it. Somebody wants something. Something standing in their way of getting it. Intention and obstacle. Once you have that, that's the drive shaft of the car, and you can. Let me use a different metaphor. It's the clothesline. You can hang on that structure. All the cool stuff that you like doing, uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, you know nifty dialogue. Or, Imagery or whatever you want, but you have to have uh, uh, intention and obstacle. And mm. I would recommend that they uh, read Aristotle's Poetics. Mm -hmm. Anthony. Well, I think every new writer, this was certainly true of me, stands on the border of this undiscovered country called, you know, the arts. And you don't know whether you've got anything to offer. Um, and you really question, do I have any talent? And this question of talent, we don't know where creative, creativity comes from in our brain. But my experience is that the writer I was when I began is, was only a fraction of what I feel, feel capable of doing now and mm. that you can grow your talent. Mm. And don't stand on that threshold saying, I'm uncertain about my talent. You can grow that part of yourself. Mm. I, I think um, tell only the story you can tell. Uh, I, that's what I tell, you know, I teach and that's what I tell students. It's if you're trying to tell stories uh, for a larger largest audience possible, the best way to get to them is by telling the story that really connects with you, that means something that you think people closest to you can relate to. That's the driving force. And the second thing I think I've learned is that screenwriting, maybe not for Aaron, but screenwriting, at least for me, is more like sculpture. And it's the type of thing that you slowly have to carve away at to get to that final destination. Mm. Emily. Um, I'd say somewhat similar to what you were saying. I know a lot of writers who are just trying to write because they're like, oh, this would be a cool thing to write. But I, I think the best work comes from when you are really grappling with something that you are personally kind of, eth like a, a thing you've been thinking about, something ethically or morally that you've been kind of uh, debating in your own head mm -hmm. or kind of uh, debating with your, about your own family or about your own place in the world, I think that's where the best work comes from, not just like, oh, this would be a cool thing. So I think if, if it can speak to something that you're personally going through, not literally, but you know, emotionally, I think that's, that always makes a better piece of work than this might be cool. Um, and also just get the thing done. Like I think that's, so many people are just like, oh, I keep starting and I don't know how to, like just get it done and then you can go back and work on it, but just get just to the end. Get to the end and then keep working on it and don't don't get yourself bogged down and like re, I know people that have like a perfect 15 pages of something yeah. and never get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. okay. Coppola or said yeah. to Lucas or Lucas said Coppola, to Coppola. I think. That you know, you just you have to go through a full pass and then go through mm -hmm. segment, and that's the sculpture idea. It's like yeah. if you mm -hmm. if you focus on the hand of David, you just get a beautiful, perfect hand, and the rest of the body will be you know distorted. Mm -hmm. But you slowly dig away at the clay until the the form emerges. Jordan, I would say you know with with writing, you know everybody, we all deal with writer's block. We all get in our own way, and um, my sort of mantra was follow the fun. <laughs> so that means if, if I'm not having fun, I'm doing it wrong. Huh. If you get to a point where you hate what you're doing, it's up to you to figure out how to have fun while doing it. Really? To look at it from a different angle, to look, you know, so I would be- Is writing, writing fun? It's very fun. It's super fun. Kind of fun. If it's going well, and I, follow the fun should be on a t-shirt. Yeah, it's yeah. great, yeah. You yeah, it's know, it's, yeah, at, at a certain point, you, uh, it, you know, in the middle of questioning, what am I doing? This move, uh, uh, no one's gonna wanna sit through this awful sequence, yeah. sequence or, and that's when I would say, you know what, put that down, let's go, and I get to design a secret society. Like, that's the most fun way I can spend my afternoon work on that and eventually that gives me enough space to come back and deal with what the scene is. That's great. Good, thank you. Well, this is an excellent first draft. <laughs> We're now going to do it all again. For the <laughs> thank you so much for taking part in great pleasure. Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter writers. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Ready? Okay, quiet on set. And I lock down the lens. Yeah. Let's do it. Hi, I'm Margot Robbie. Brian Cranston. Robert Pattinson. John Boyega. I'm Sam Rockwell. Willem Dafoe. Emma Stone. Alison Janney. Guillermo del Toro. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thanks for watching The Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter. On YouTube. On YouTube.